It's Memorial Day and we play day baseball between the Rough Riders and the Tulsa Drillers and we take a look at things from the other side as Dennis Higgins, the voice of the Tulsa Drillers, joins us on the broadcast. Uh, Dennis, one thing that always strikes me when we come here is the lack of runs that score between these two teams. You know, I was looking through it. There have only been four times out of the 20 or so games they've played here uh, where teams have scored more than five runs. Uh, That's something that you must have gotten used to when they started playing in this ballpark. Yeah, obviously great pitching. But, you know, I would, just before this interview, I was uh, lamenting the fact with uh, one of our owners, Jeff Hubbard, in the three games this weekend, we've drawn 22,713 people, three games combined. Now, that's a one oak field record, most fans in a three-day span. And over those three days, the Drillers have scored a total of four runs on 17 hits. And no surprise, they've lost all three games. There's a way to entertain your fans. <laughs> well, it's a big difference from the old stadium, right? Yeah, you know, the old stadium had a really short left field fence. So pitchers did not like pitching there. Hitters loved hitting there. And there were a lot of high scoring games. But uh, yeah, this park here, you know, the last two nights, as you've noted, we've had uh, gusty winds blowing in from left center field towards the third base foul line. No doubt about it, they've, they've knocked down some balls. Because left field here, uh, we get a lot of home runs here to left field, uh, especially if the wind's not blowing. But it has been gusting the last couple of nights, so I think that's helped. But I think I've been really impressed with Frisco's pitching. I mean, you guys have been rolling out guys who are throwing the ball in the low to mid-90s night after night. Yeah, the Riders uh, certainly have some, some gasolina coming out of the bullpen. I want to ask you a little bit about your left fielder, Kyle Parker. He obviously made the, the misplay last night, but a guy with a real interesting story, played at Clemson University as both a baseball player and a football player as a quarterback. Uh, one thing that would strike me, uh, going from that high-charged atmosphere uh, in the ACC and football to coming out to minor league baseball where you're not playing in front of 70,000, 80,000 fans, uh, it, it must be a big change for him. I think so. And, you know, there's been a lot of coverage. He is quite an athlete. Uh, You know, he had that one year where he's the only college player to throw 20 touchdown passes and hit 20 home runs in the same year. He did that at Clemson University. But he has said that, um, you know, he's glad he chose baseball. He really had a passion for football. In fact, took a lot less. He had a signing bonus that was, uh, I want to say, $2.7 million. He ended up signing for like one8 or nine. He took $800,000 less to play his second season of football at Clemson just because he wanted to make sure that uh, it was out of his system. And he tells everybody that ever talks to him, he says, I'm glad I chose baseball. I do miss football. But he said, it's still I'm able to come to work every day in a, you know this atmosphere of sports. So I think he made the right decision. Um, I know he's a very good quarterback, but I think it's, uh, I think it's, I don't know about easier, but I think you have a better chance to make it Major League Baseball in the NFL. I want to ask you a little bit about some of the players that are back from last year's team. You look at Nina, Rowling, and Mathis, and all three of them had their struggles last year for one reason or another, and all three of those guys have come out uh, like gangbusters here through the first two months this season. Yeah, Nina was just announced today as a Texas League Player of the Week and certainly well-deserved, hit over 400, having a great season, and he's always been really good with his glove, really good. And he's been playing some shortstop this year aside from second Mathis uh, had a very disappointing year last year. He'd be the first guy to tell you that. He was the California League Player of the Year two years ago at Modesto. Last year battled a couple of injuries, but ended up hitting like 240. And so it was a real down year for him, but he's picked it up. He's having a good season. And Rowling is a guy that needs to stay healthy because when he's healthy, he'll do what he's doing like this year. He's got 12 homers, 35 RBIs. He was on a home run hitting binge until you guys came to town. You kind of quieted him down a little bit, but uh, all three very good ball players. One thing that's been noticeable here through the first couple of games of this series, uh, I, I don't know if it's intentional or not, but uh, very much a Rockies-themed uh, homestand between the uniforms you wore on Saturday and the mascot for the Rockies that was here yesterday, Dinger. Uh, is that part of the Rockies trying to grow their footprint here? You've been here for now more than 10 years in terms of an organization uh, and try and grow that fan base here in, a, in an unnatural market? You know, it's an interesting observation on your part. I didn't really about, think about that. I knew Dinger was here last night, the, the Rockies uh, mascot. The purple uniforms were just by chance. That was the Alzheimer's Association. It was a fundraiser, and they chose those uniforms, yellow, or I mean, excuse me, purple with pinstripes. They weren't the best looking. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, but I do believe there is a very strong, very healthy relationship between Denver and Tulsa. And next year I'm told that they're actually going to, I think, incorporate a, uh, an alternate, alternate, 
alternate uniform uh, that's going to be purple. They may wear those on Sundays just to uh, the, the colors of the Rockies. But it's a great relationship. And, uh, of course, the Rockies, I think, when, and they have a lot of people that come here from the front office. When you see this ballpark, you know how beautiful One Oak Field is. It's, to me, it's a no-brainer for them. They send most of their major league rehabbers here instead of AAA Colorado Springs because of this facility, this ballpark. And you had one guy who's technically not a rehabber, but we saw last year in a similar role in uh, Roy Oswald. Uh, what were your observations from watching him uh, make his first start with Tulsa the other night? I thought it was pretty good. I think he was pleased. Uh, he talked afterwards about his mechanics. We're not where he wants him to be. He said he was opening up too early as he was delivering the pitches. But I think his velocity was good. It was 91-92, hit 93 a couple of times. He uh, pitched five innings, 75 pitches, uh, gave up three runs, back-to-back home runs. The thing he was most disappointed in was he had three walks, and he said, I never walked that many people. So it would be interesting to see. He's going to make his second start in Midland on Wednesday, but I would, uh, I would duly note that we are leaving after the game today for about a nine- or ten-hour bus ride to Midland, and he is not on the bus. He is flying over himself. <laughs> I guess the perks of being a uh, former big league all-star. Well, uh, Dennis, always great to come and visit with you and come here to One Oak Field. Thanks so much for the time and uh, a safe bus travel out to Midland today. Thanks, Alex. And I would be remiss if I did not say happy birthday. Happy <laughs> 27th birthday, young man. Thank you. That's Dennis Higgins, the voice of the Tulsa Drillers. And we're back after this on the Frisco Rough Riders Baseball Network.